thank you Alan for that kind introduction. Um, thank you Jay and Alan for organizing this and inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I had asked Alan whether I should give my talk on quantum communications or quantum sensing and I did not get an answer so I decided maybe I will do the latter. So, he, your, so, Alan is right, my, most of my work uh, during my PhD with Jeff at MIT and uh, thereafter at BBN uh, was looking at quantum limits of classical communications, quantum communications, secured communications, covert communications, uh, quantum repeaters and so forth. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, some work we have been doing again over the years on various problems in quantum imaging and sensing, uh, looking at quantum limits of such problems and how do you get there. So I, uh, as Alan said, I joined the University of Arizona's College of Optical Sciences uh, almost exactly one year ago, uh, but joint appointment with the ECE department. Uh, and our group, uh, so my, my students and postdocs, we are, we are working on a variety of areas uh, 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 focused on uh, looking at photon as a quantum mechanical object. What can you tell in terms of its fundamental information processing limits and how do you achieve those? Uh, <clears throat> So, um, the high level philosophy that has underlied uh, most of my research uh, so far, um, it goes back to the fact that light is a fundamentally it's a quantum mechanical object. So, wherever light gets used, say in communications or sensing or imaging, computing, uh, treating that as a quantum mechanical object and hence being able to borrow very powerful tools from quantum information and estimation theory often lets you uh, uh, quickly figure out what the fundamental performance limits associated with those applications are. Um, and uh, calculating those fundamental limits is the first step, but then the next step is how do you get there? How do you figure out how to build, for example, a receiver for optical communications, a problem I know that Alan was, has been very interested in, um, and also designing for, uh, the optimal transmitters, codes, and so forth. How do you take that mathematical description of that uh, fundamental limit, whether it be the capacity limit or a resolution limit or some sort of a uh, uh, performance limit and translate that to a structured system. And oftentimes what you see is that if you know something more about what information you are trying to extract from that photon, either in the context of extracting data from the communication channel or whether it be the optical pulse that is returning from your from a target that you are trying to get some information about that target about, um, you can often predispose that information bearing light in, in the most information favorable manner to that inevitable detection noise that is yet to come. So we know that all detection has some minimum amount of noise that quantum mechanics uh, mandates. So you cannot do away with that. But what you can do is that pre-process that light that carries the information, either classically, sometimes you need to do that quantum mechanically some transformation to put that light in the best possible way, present that to that detector noise. Okay, and this has been the theme across a lot of the work that I have been involved in, in communications and sensing both. And I'll try to give some examples of that in the context of a few imaging problems today. Um, and uh, finally, uh, the, all of this work is particularly useful when the information to be processed is already in the optical domain. In the, in, the, in a natural way. For example, in imaging problems, the information is already there in the optical domain. So instead of detecting that in using, say, a conventional detector array and then post-processing that information, the question is, uh, if you had a magic device that could directly act on that information in the optical domain, what does quantum physics tell you in terms of the fundamental performance limits? On the other hand, light can be also used for quantum computing in principle where you, it is not natural in the optical domain, you encode information in the photons and then make them process information. But uh, typically, uh, most of the important applications are for problems where the information is already there in the optical domain. So I will talk about sensing today, but I just wanted to give you a brief uh, overview of some of our uh, research thrusts very quickly. Um, as Alan mentioned, a, lo a lot of my early work, uh, both during my PhD and after that, for several years at BBN, originally funded by a DARPA program called INFO that many of you were involved in here as well. Uh, we were looking at quantum limits of classical communications. Okay. Just, you're sending classical data using laser pulses, um, uh, but uh, the question is, what is the fundamental limit of your number of bits that you can encode per photon, per pulse? 
Um, and turns out that the optimal receivers, they need to make collective measurements, joint measurements over long blocks of, 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 um, of your coherent state laser pulses in order to get to that classical capacity limit. So even though your data is being encoded in a product state of coherent states, you have, you have no quantumness of the transmitter. You need quantumness locally at the receiver to get to those fundamental limits. So we did a lot of work on looking at such receiver designs and so forth. Um, quantum limits of both passive and active optical imaging. This is a topic I'll talk about today, so I'll not spend too much time on that right now. Um, we have uh, several projects ongoing. The orange ones are current projects. We're looking at uh, QKD and related problems. So what does quantum mechanics say in terms of fundamental limits uh, of sending data reliably and securely? Okay, so quantum key distribution is about sending data that is undecodable by an all-powerful adversary, as we all know about. Um, uh, here, but we also started looking at uh, quantum limits of covert communications. It's an ex extra layer of security where you ask the question, how much data can be reliably transmitted that cannot be even uh, the, the detected, the communication attempt itself be hidden from an all-powerful quantum-enabled adversary. So you're hiding your information content within the Planck law limited thermal noise floor. What are the information theoretic limits of that? And how do you realize such systems? Um, Going from point-to-point -point quantum communications to long-distance quantum communications, you need things called quantum repeaters. These are special purpose quantum uh, gadgets, which nobody has, unfortunately, yet. You know, um, know that uh, Elizabeth is very interested in this topic, and there are many people who are working on quantum memories. They are interested in building quantum repeaters. It's a very, very important tool that we have to have for a long-distance quantum communications. We have had several theoretical research projects, and we just started a, and, uh, an experimental project along with a mind colleague Lin Ran Fan is a new faculty at Optical Sciences, build uh, continuous variable cluster state sources using nanophotonic devices for quantum building, all optical quantum repeaters. Uh, we are also interested in quantum computing, but of a very special kind. I'm interested in continuous variable cluster state quantum computing, and we, are, we just started a couple of projects on that. And then eventually we are interested in quantum networking, building, um, uh, not just building the repeaters, but how do you route information on a repeater network? If I had multiple entanglement flows on a quantum repeater network, how do those quantum nodes decide at any, what to do, what bell measurements to do, what sort of quantum and classical actions to do so as to support the maximum rate region, maximum flows for multiple information flows? Okay, so with that, uh, let me switch to the topic of discussion today, uh, quantum sensing. Um, so we all have uh, uh, heard of using quantum for sensing in many contexts, perhaps the most uh, uh, the, the famous one that we all have heard about is the LIGO application, uh, sensing gravitational waves. <clears throat> and that arguably is probably the only one out there that they are really looking into a practical um, use of, of using quantum states. In that case, it's a squeeze states of light injected into a giant max length parameter to get a better sensitivity of sensing a tiny phase modulation. Um, Optical uh, quantum sensing is typically good in situations where there is not a lot of loss. Uh, biological sensing applications, so near field sensing applications in general, they are better, better for quantum enabled applications. And I'll tell you more about some of these application scenarios. Uh, uh, but um, there has been um, uh, work considering quantum um, using not entangled states of photons for radar applications, for target detection. I'll touch on this, some, a theory project we did some time back that some experiments were done more recently. Uh, there was a suggestion of using entangled states for distributed sensing in a long bas baseline astronomy situation. Uh, again, I'll talk about the notion of using entanglement for sensing later today. Um, but there are uh, the types of sensing applications uh, can be roughly categorized into these uh, high-level buckets. Um, so when I say quantum sensing, what do we really mean? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, as I said at the beginning, all light is quantum. Um, and similarly, all detection is quantum. Right? But um, uh, there are certain kinds of optical states and detection methods whose uh, photo detection statistics or the, or the result of that experiment uh, cannot be described by the semi-classical theory of photo detection. You cannot describe it by, by the short noise theory of photo detection. Uh, for example, states that cannot be represented as a mixture of coherent states, states that do not have a p-function representation. So those are called quantum states. So this is how, what I would call a quantum state. Uh, 
because such states, its photo detection statistics cannot be described correctly by classical, semi-classical theory. Um, so for optical imaging, um, sometimes you would see that there are problems where you are using quantum uh, just as a tool to represent classical light for, being, for you to be able to have access to a much more powerful tool from quantum estimation theory, for example, to tell what the fundamental performance limit is. But when, when you get the answer for what that optimal measurement is, you might be able to hindsight describe the result of, the, of, that, um, uh, of, of, of that system completely semi-classically. On the other hand, there will be examples where that answer might involve your receiver doing some uh, quantum operations, like for example, squeezing or some non-classical operation that cannot be described classically. So that's sort of my classification of quantum versus classical. Passive versus active is, uh, passive imaging is where you're seen as either naturally illuminated or, or self-luminous. Uh, you're not sending out photons to image. Active sensing is where I'm sending photons out to an object and looking at the return to get some signal out of that. Um, Task specific versus scene reconstructive, um, that is another classification of imaging problems where uh, when I say scene reconstructive imaging, that's where you're, I'm thinking about getting a, a pretty reconstruction of the scene, either trying to get a picture, or get, trying to make maybe a, do a, a measurement of uh, the uh, velocity field or some sort of a continuous reconstruction of, an, of, a, of, of whatever parameter you're interested in. Whereas task-specific imaging is where you are trying to get something very, very specific about the problem that you're looking at. For example, whether or not there is a target over there. Uh, or I'm looking at a constellation of point sources, I'm just trying to say how many point sources are there. Something very specific. You may not be interested in getting a good reconstruction of the scene itself. And if you know something specific about the scene, you sometimes are able to do, um, uh, come up with a very, very powerful methods to get better performance. So I'm going to talk about four specific problems today. And uh, we'll see how far we can get. And I would encourage um, uh, you to ask questions as we go. Uh, it's more important that we spend some time on one a few problems to get you interested. And you're always welcome to come back. And we can talk more uh, today afternoon. Uh, so I will start, about <coughs> uh, start with a discussion of, of a, a very simple problem, but a very elegant problem in passive imaging. Uh, which was, goes back to a paper that was written by uh, Man Kei Sang uh, at, at Singapore. And we have been doing some f uh, several extensions of that and trying to gain f uh, physical insights into using uh, quantum tools to get fundamental limits of passive imaging. Okay? Because these, are, these are obviously completely classical light sources that you're imaging. And then I'll talk about three scenarios in active imaging. Um, and uh, they're all in uh, different regimes of loss and noise. And the reason I chose these problems is that when you have high loss and lo or versus low loss or high noise versus low noise, there are certain techniques that work and certain techniques that don't seem to work. Okay. And this is just to get an insight for where we might benefit from using quantum resources and sensing problems. Uh, at optical frequencies, okay, typically, uh, you are looking at not a lot of noise okay, in, a, a, in terms of thermal noise. I mean, there is a lot more thermal noise in terms of per mode thermal mean photon number at microwave frequencies compared to optical frequencies. But um, in most uh, standoff imaging applications, if you're sending out light and looking at the reflection, there's a lot of loss, return path loss. Okay? Um, although on uh, short range applications, the losses can be low. Um, uh, but it's very uh, artificial to get a high noise into a high noise environment in optical frequencies if the noise is just coming from a thermal radiation, unless you are in an actively jammed environment. So at the high level, before we go into these applications, the, what we found through several app problems is um, that if you're in a situation where you, don't, where, where you have uh, in a low noise and high loss environment. This is arguably the most standard situation you would be in in most of the optical imaging applications. Typically, sending quantum states of light is not a good idea at the transmitter. You might still benefit from doing some quantum processing locally within the confines of your receiver. Um, if you are in a low noise, low loss regime, this is actually a practical regime you can be in for near field imaging applications. 
uh, using entangled states or quantum states for uh, for sensing can be a possibility. So the uh, the LIGO application, for example, is one example there. You have a local interferometer. You are doing something quantum in the, within the confines of the receiver. Uh, but there is this funny regime of high loss and high noise, where again using entanglement can give you uh, potentially a huge relative performance improvement over the best possible classical strategy. So this was a, this is probably the most counterintuitive one of these three regimes. So I'll, I'll, that's why I put it in, in, in the first place. So let's start talking about passive imaging, and then we'll see how far we can uh, get along each one of these topics. Okay. So passive imaging, we are talking here about imaging uh, naturally illuminated objects. So uh, the the particular problems that we will be interested in are point source constellations. And these point sources, they are quasi-monochromatic, but incoherently radiating point sources. So they are not coherent light sources, but we will be assuming they are at a given frequency. And we will use tools from quantum estimation theory, for example, quantum Kramer Rao bounds or quantum Chernoff bounds to figure out if I had no restrictions whatsoever on acting upon the light collected by your aperture within the integration time. You're not putting that on your focal plane array or in a CCD array. If I just treat that, that light field over that integration time and volume as a quantum state, as a density operator, and use tools from quantum estimation theory, what does it tell you in terms of the best possible thing you could have done to that light to extract a particular information? And as we will see, the answers will involve doing certain spatial mode transformations. These are linear mode transformations. They are not quantum transformations. They are classical transformations. Uh, after which, if you were to detect, you can suddenly predispose the information in a much, much more favorable way to the detection noise. And suddenly, a lot of very, very old uh, uh, or long-held beliefs about resolution uh, sort of goes away if you, if you allow yourselves to do those uh, processing. So this is a current project in collaboration with Yelena Vukovic's group in Stanford. Um, and this picture that I'm showing here is one such mode sorter that her group is uh, uh, helping design. Uh, this is a binary mode demultiplexer. And what we are trying to build here, and I'll get to the theory of why we want to build it later on, is so you have multi-spatial mode light hitting this uh, grating coupler. And uh, this is, so if you decompose this light into uh, some orthogonal mode basis, in this case, uh, they're showing a Hermite Gauss mode basis. So this is the first order Hermite Gauss mode. You just want to couple in light into that mode in a single mode waveguide. So this is a f the, the waveguide mode. So you're converting that light into this waveguide mode, and the rest of the light goes through. So this is a binary mode demultiplexer. The, and they're using a, a binary structure of two materials with two different refractive indices to design it. If there's a, it's a numerical approach that their group has developed. So this is the kind of thing that we would want, in, and in principle, if we would want a mode demultiplexer that can select a, a set of orthogonal modes or any set of orthogonal modes dynamically from the input field. So, uh, so let's look at the particular problem that, um, that came originally from Man Kaysan's group. So he set up the problem as discriminating to the separation between two point sources. So you're looking at a binary star constellation. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a little contrived problem because you give yourself a perfect knowledge of the center of the constellation. So you know exactly that you're looking at the center of two stars. And you also know that they are exactly the same brightness. And uh, they are a single frequency uh, emitters. And <laughs> so it's very, very contrived, as you can see. Uh, but the only unknown parameter there is the angular separation between the, the, the two stars you're looking at. Okay. And, and as we know, uh, if, uh, if the angular separation between the stars is of the order of what is called the Rayleigh angle, which is the wavelength of the light divided by the diameter of your pupil, then uh, the two star uh, intensity signature on your, on your focal plane uh, is indistinguishable from the one star uh, signature that you get, the intensity signature, because the two Gaussians, they, are over, they overlap too, too closely. And just to give ours be, be, to be fair to ourselves, we say that the total photon flux is the same under both hypotheses, so that you can't just detect the intensity and say that I got two sources, not one. Okay, so this is a question. Uh, correct. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that in a moment. So what the question is that if you, 
integrate for a long enough time, you can always resolve these two. Okay? The question is at what rate do you gather information as your photons trickle in? So very good point, and I'll, I think that's the next slide I'm going to talk about that dependence. So what we are going to do is that to allow ourselves to do something before you put that light onto your focal plane array. Okay? And by doing, putting that something, in this case I'm showing a spatial mode sorter, the question is can that rate at which informations are coming as, as, as with photons, can you, can you enhance that? So I want to think of a traditional focal plane array, um, although this is a very roundabout way of thinking about it, I want to think of a focal plane array as a, as a trivial mode sorter followed by a detector. And the modes that your detector array is sorting are the pixel basis modes. So I can define a spatial mode to be one over this pixel and zero everywhere else. And another spatial mode to be one over here and zero everywhere else. So these are trivially orthogonal, right? So you can think of your detector array to be, to be de sorting those modes and then detecting them. Now, instead of detecting these pixel basis modes, if I allowed my, myself to have a mode sorter that can take, say, the jth Hermite Gauss mode and map that to the jth pixel basis mode here, then I would have that spatial mode, the multiplexer that we need. Okay, so uh, now going back to your question about uh, uh, how, how, at what rate do you, do you collect information about the, uh, the separation, even when you use a, 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 the ideal focal plane array. This. So let's just do again, uh, set a baseline. Let's assume that our focal plane array for the, uh, for the standard imager that is limited by this re Rayleigh resolution width, let's assume that it's a perfect continuum detector. You have absolutely infinitesimally tiny pixels, 100% fill factor, unity detection efficiency, no dark counts, no after pulsing, nothing. So absolutely, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a plane that is generating a spatio-temporal Poisson point process that is driven by the intensity of the light that falls on it. Um, now, even if I have that detector, it is limited by this Rayleigh resolution limit because the two intensity signatures, they just fall on top of each other when the, the theta becomes smaller than lambda over t. The mean square error of how well you can uh, get, uh, how well you can measure theta, which is defined as this, the average value of theta minus theta hat, your guess squared, um, it goes as one over n, n being the total number of photons you integrated over the integration time. So this goes back to the, uh, what I was just saying is that uh, no matter how small my angular separation is, even if it is very, very small and smaller than lambda over d, uh, I will still have a mean squared error dk as 1 over n. But then there is a constant that sits here, this constant proportionality, which is a function of the actual angular separation itself and my choice of the receiver, how I decided to, to detect my, that light that came in. So for an ideal focal plane array, when theta goes to zero, this constant uh, just just goes away. So it just goes to goes to zero. So as you, if this constant becomes very small, then you have to integrate forever to get the MSE to go down. But you know, when theta is no matter how small theta is, this is not ever exactly zero. But it goes to zero at theta equals to zero. So if you plot that um, this f of theta. And I'm going to divide this f of theta by this, uh, this constant. This is the value of this, fun this constant in the infinite uh, theta limit. So this is when the two point sources are so, so far apart that you can perfectly, uh, you can resolve them. In that limit, this constant is 4 pi squared over 3 sigma squared, sigma squared. Sigma is the width of the point square function. Okay. So it, you get this curve, this black line over here. So see, this goes to 1 so because I'm dividing this by this constant at a large theta. But uh, when it becomes, uh, theta becomes less than, so the sigma is your lambda over d. When it goes smaller than that, it goes to zero. Okay. And uh, then we ask the question that uh, if you don't constrain yourself to building a receiver that way, if you just wrote down the density operator of, of the photon integrated over the integration time and say what is the best possible receiver and its performance, uh, you get a very surprising result. Um, you get that this f, it just stays at that value, 4 pi squared over 3 sigma squared, no matter how, how big theta is. Okay. And this was originally written in, in, um, in, in the paper by Manke, and then we generalize it to an actual hard aperture pupil and did some, some additional work on that. But this, this result initially sounds very surprising that, well, it just shows that the Rayleigh 
traditional Rayleigh limit completely goes away. But remember that behind that result, there is also an assumption that we made that we knew exactly the center of the constellation that we were looking at. So we knew exactly how to uh, resolve, uh, how to um, you know, point my mode sorter, uh, where should I center my mode sorter in order to get exactly that performance. And the, this limit, this quantum limit is actually attained by a particular mode sorter that separates all the sync Bessel modes. So the first mode is your PSF mode. This is a centered mode. If I had a point source in the center, then that's the signature you would get. This is the Fourier transform of the, of the rectangular function. And you, there is a orthogonalization of those modes that you go from the zeroth to the first and so on. If you had a mode sorter that separated all these sync Bessel modes is when you get that flat line. But I knew the centroid of the constellation, so I know exactly where to point that center of that sink. Okay, so that's why we were, we were getting that. But still, it is a very interesting result. Uh, we then said, OK, what, I, what if, if I had a, a, um, an extended object? For example, you had a, an object like this. And you're looking at the object and then trying to find its length. So if I model this as a, as a continuum of point sources, and again, we assume that we know exactly the center of, the cons of where you're looking at and that the, the intensity is uniform. It's a uniformly radiating object. You again get a very similar result, that you get the quantum limit calculation. Uh, this is the performance of your classical ideal image plane detection array. And then uh, in this case, a Hermite Gauss mode sorter uh, you know, gives you the, the performance limit. Uh, it matches the quantum limit. Um, and we assumed in this case a Gaussian uh, aperture. So if I had a square aperture, then the optimal mode basis will still be the sink Bessel mode for this problem. And the actual, the, these, uh, these uh, kramer rao bound mandated performance limits, these are just, they give you only bounds on the mean square error, but the true mean square errors also show the same performance uh, improvement. Then we said, okay, what if you had a hypothesis test to do? Okay? Instead of uh, guessing the, two, the separation between the two point sources, you knew that there was either one point source or two point sources, and you are trying to do a hypothesis test. In this case, you are interested in minimizing a probability of error. Okay. Um, if you are familiar with, uh, with uh, quantum uh, churn of exponents or quantum churn of bounds, the problem that we are looking at here from the mathematical standpoint, you, have, you look at the, the number of temporal modes over your integration time, which is roughly the product of your integration time and your optical bandwidth. Each temporal mode is excited in, a, in it's an IID quantum state. Uh, under one hypothesis, you get, say, rho 0 tensor m. In another hypothesis, you have rho 1 tensor m. m is the number of temporal modes. And uh, if you write down the minimum error probability of telling them apart, it goes as e to the minus some constant called the Chernoff exponent times the number of temporal modes, which is proportional to the, your integration time, and hence proportional to the total number of photons you collected <coughs> during the integration time. And what we found is that if I use an, uh, a direct imaging, an ideal focal plane array, that this constant, this goes as theta to the 4, where theta is the separation, whereas the optimal measurement gives you a better scaling, theta square scaling. And in this case, again, we found that this binary, uh, binary spatial mode demultiplexer that just separates out the zeroth order mode from the rest of the light gets you exactly the quantum limited performance. So something I should say here, remember when we saw this flat line and this idea at this focal plane arrest performance. I didn't talk about the red and the blue line here. So if I had a mode sorter that instead of separating all the sync Bessel modes, if it only separated the zeroth order mode, meaning the, this function, the sync function, from the rest of the light. So this is exactly what that picture I showed you in the very beginning where you have multi-mode light falling in. I am separating one mode and letting all the light pass through. So you're just separating two modes. You have only two detectors, two bucket detectors. You have no resolution. That gives you this performance given by this blue line over here. So it goes actually very close to the quantum limit at zero separation or close small, small separation. Whereas even a gigapixel array, a traditional detector array, will, will the performance goes to zero. So that binary space also works for this one versus two problem. So now we say that, well, these were all sort of contrived situations where you gave yourself the knowledge of the centroid. But ideally, you want, when you're doing a comparison between the classical detector and the best possible thing you could build, you would want to give them the same priors. So if you start with a situation, question, yeah. I, I, just going back, I think the question. Yeah. So when theta goes to zero, mm -hmm. 
theta there is a yeah yes including zero so this is the function this is it still goes to zero yes yes okay so what is it showing that so this is i think the point that alexi was making that you so even if you are really sub or highly sub relay resolved you can integrate forever for a long long time to get the signature in fact if you look at these big um, telescope clusters uh, that they used to to image very dim objects they would sometimes integrate for days and months to get the signature they are they care for so you you still have that 1 over n scaling and n is proportional to your integration time it's just that this if this constant is tiny you would have to integrate for that long that much longer but what the quantum analysis tells you is that that way of thinking was was hard ingrained in our way of thinking about discriminating these uh, overlapping intensity patterns so turns out that detecting intensity in the focal plane is one of the worst things you could do for this problem question Um, again, a good question. I, so for it, so the answer to that question is that it does always get harder when theta becomes smaller and smaller. So when I first saw Monkey's paper and that flat line, it 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 does seem very artificial that theta should say it should stay flat when theta becomes small. The reason it stays flat is because you give yourself a lot of prior information. You know exactly the center of the constellation where to look. Now one would say that for the one versus two problem, we are doing the same. but then when you allow yourself not to have that knowledge when you say that i don't know where to look perhaps i have i take my whole integration time and divide it up into two segments where i dedicate the first segment uh, to just estimating the center of the constellation okay i'm not trying to resolve anything i'm just trying to say where the, where is the light coming from using a standard focal plane array and then using that noisy estimate of the centroid I point my mode sorter for the latter half, for the latter fraction of the integration time. Then what you would see, you would still see an improvement over fo over focal plane array, but this line, this flat line, will just still crash to zero. So that it's staying flat. In fact, there is a, just a singularity here. Only at theta equals to zero, it is it is it is not one, but anything greater than zero, it is one. So it, it's a little artificial because you are giving yourself that prior information. In fact that's exactly what I was going to talk next is this two stage receiver where you dedicate an alpha fraction of your photons to detecting the or estimating the centroid of the constellation and thus the mean square error of gauging the center of the constellation goes as 1 over n1 where n1 is the photons collected during that first stage and then after that first stage you you implement a binary spade uh special mode demultiplexer using the rest of the photons and you do a maximum likelihood estimate of the separation based on all the information you have collected in both the stages so what you see here is that so this was the flat line i talked about this is the total number of photons integrated uh, for that number you have this ideal binary spade and this is the ideal direct detection so this is just two modes this is in, and this is the full direct detection camera this goes to zero um So first if you do a calculation and say that if i dedicate a certain fraction of your integration time to using direct imaging but just to get the center of the constellation okay just to gauge where the center is and then calculate the quantum fisher information on the rest of the light meaning you're saying i'm going to guess the gauge the center or estimate the center using an alpha fraction of my integration time and then after that i'm saying i I'm just going to use the best possible thing that physics allows me for the rest of the integration time, and then the performance that you get is depending upon what alpha is. You get these different these lines here for your Fisher information, normalized to the infinite theta limit performance, which is this flat line. Clearly, when you have integrated lots of photons for the first stage, your estimate of the very of, of the center is very good, so your performance is still very close to this flat line, but it does go to zero at at theta equals to 0 unlike it's saying flat and if you have integrated fewer and fewer photons obviously the performance is lower 
But then what we do is that for the same alpha, we calculate what if we gave a binary space to that second stage, binary spatial mode demultiplexer. And what you see is that at low angular separation, the performance is very close to when we did not restrict the receiver choice for that second stage. So with that in mind, what we said is that, well, this is just an indication that this two-stage camera with a binary spade uh, might be something that outperforms the direct imaging performance. And it, uh, it does without the knowledge of the centroid. So if you see this plot, just look at one of these and forget about these black lines. Just look at, this is mean square error. And by the way, this is not Fisher information. This is the true mean square error using Monte Carlo simulations my student Michael did, um, times the the total photon number collected during the integration time normalized to your, uh, your sigma square is the width, the Rayleigh width. This is the performance of the direct detection, meaning if I gave all my integration time, alpha equals to one means my entire integration time is given to an ideal focal plane array. Whereas different choices of alpha, it gives you different performance and as you can see there's a trade-off. I want to, if I, the longer I spend in the first stage, I get a better estimate for the centroid. So my second stage works better. But because my second stage is this better receiver inherently, if I give it few, less time, it doesn't have that much time to do its work. So there's an optimal value of alpha. With that optimal value of alpha, you get a performance which think of this as this lower envelope of this as the performance of this adaptive receiver. Um, so anyhow, so with uh, that, that was just one. Alan, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what is the optimal receiver if I don't have the knowledge of the centroid? We still don't know that yet. In fact, what this result shows uh, over here is that the, the optimal, so see these lines, what, what were these lines? Just to remind you, we were doing, giving a, a certain fraction of your integration time to a focal plane array to determine the centroid. And then we are saying, I don't want to restrict what you are doing for this latter stage, okay? But this, the fact that these performance this is going down as theta increases, this, this, this tells us that um, using direct imaging, that focal plane array for estimating the centroid was not the best thing. It, was, it sounds like it's the most obvious thing to do if you're trying to just see where the light is coming from. But that is not the quantum optimal receiver for estimating the centroid. So this result does not show this the best possible thing you could ever do, but this lower envelope, the fact that this is below this performance of an ideal focal plane array shows that this particular receiver. That particular yes, exactly. And something that I'm not showing here, which is still work in progress, is that you can determine that when to switch your photons from the first to the second stage dynamically during the integration time. And uh, when you, uh, so, so you don't have to a priori know what the separation um, uh, of the constellation is. In software, that excellent question. So I want. So this is. So what Alan is asking, uh, why cannot we just take the data out of your focal plane array and then do the mode separation in electronically in software? And again, this goes. The answer goes back to what I said in the very beginning of my talk: is that that detector, you are letting your light hit with the Poisson shot noise, right when you detect it, right? At right that that point, your information is is gone. It's it's gone to some level. You cannot recover that back by any means. This is uh, kind of like uh, the same sort of philosophy that goes behind things like the Dolinar receiver, which you know of. You, know, there, you want to do something to the information bearing light field before you detect it in the best possible way. Okay, so let me not dwell too much more on this. Uh, we are working on looking at quantum limit of parameter estimation from a general multimode classical field. Uh, Multi-parameter estimation problems get even more hard. And then how do you design that mode transformation is by itself a very interesting mathematical problem. So there are many, many uh, ideas on, de on designing a given desired trans spatial mode transformation using holographic means, using spatial light modulators and successions of them, using numerically optimized grating structures. And, but there is no very nice map that you can take from the, a unitary, description, uh, unitary matrix description of a mode transformation on a certain set of basis, a certain mode basis to a, a, a physical design of a, of a volume medium that can implement that mode sorter. 
Um, question? Exactly. This is the case where you talk about where you're using the quantum analysis to do perhaps a more efficient analysis of something that's really a classical problem. Exactly. If you, knew what, you know, if you're willing to do the work, you could have done it classically, but the quantum thing is a real, uh, a real room. It's exactly. Now, given that, that it's, it's and the whole mode separation mm -hmm. is completely classical, could you imagine perhaps an even more optimal approach where after you switch, say, to mode, Yes, that's an absolutely in, very interesting question. So I'll address the first one first. So this is a classical, as you said, the answer came out to be something that was classically describable. Even though we use quantum tools to arrive at that answer, it was almost it came about magically and that we found that but once you have the answer, it is describable classically. I'll get to another problem, also involves classically correlated thermal light. Okay. And there the optimal measurement for that problem turns out to involve a two mode squeezing operation does not is not describable classically so one problem that we are very interested in is that if i give you this is the first problem if i give you a general n mode classically correlated thermal light thermal field has a p function representation is there a natural divide of that space of p functions where that parameter extraction problem even for a single parameter can be done using something that is semi-classically describable versus something that is quantum. But to your next point, it's a very interesting question, adaptive measurements. So there is a lot of work in, the, in a totally different field of quantum information. People who do things like quantum tomography, uh, randomized benchmarking, uh, trying, to, trying to find out how well have you built your qubit or your gates, they have uh, very powerful tools on problems like these. That, and this problem has a lot of semblance to tomography. We have a set of density operators coming. They're all basically the same, but they carry some information and there's some nuisance parameters. So these unknowns are nuisance parameters in the language of estimation. And you want to, you, you want to tune your optimal measurement basis as you go through these, through these slices. We have not looked at that, but we are exploring actual connections with tomography and looking at these adaptive measurements. Okay, let's see. Let's talk about another problem and see how, um, how much we can I may not get to all these problems. So let's look at one active imaging problem. And this is a problem where uh, I was just talking about where we get a, the optimal receiver is not classically describable. So I'm just drawing a cartoon here, but the, the, this was done by a, uh, by a group of collaborators at MIT back in 2008, the first paper, this, um, where we looked at the problem of target detection. So under one hypothesis, you have a target, in the other case you don't, you send a probe, uh, towards the target, and uh, if there is a target, you get a lot of thermal noise, but you get a little bit of your signal back. So this is model, was modeled by a beam splitter with thermal noise going in under one hypothesis. And if you don't have target, your probe is completely lost, and you get back basically thermal junk. You have nothing. You just get thermal light. You are trying to tell apart between these two hypotheses. And, and this is over a set of temporal modes again. So you have your optical bandwidth of your source and the integration time that determines how many uh, independent degrees of freedom, temporal mode that, that, is, uh, that is hitting the target. Kappa is the return path transmissivity. Uh, N sub S is the mean signal photon number per mode. NB is the mean thermal photon number per mode. And then we looked at uh, another uh, transmitter that uses a spontaneous parametric down converter to generate a, a two-mode entangled state. It's a two-mode Gaussian state. You hold on to uh, one of the, the idler mode. Uh, so this is a monostatic transceiver, so you're actually holding that idler in a, in a fiber loop, perhaps, and then you send the, the signal out. The same for if there is no uh, target present, you again get back thermal junk back, but you get retain your reference. Now, note in this case, what happens is, if you are in a highly, in, in, at a, any given amount of loss, if you have a, a, your noise in the channel, if it is above a threshold, the channel becomes entanglement breaking. What that means is that no matter how entangled is your initial state, if you, when I pass on one of these two modes through this, this entanglement breaking channel, the target return mode and the retained idler reference mode, they are only in a classically correlated state. So they have a proper p-function representation. They are no longer entangled. 
Okay, it's a classical state. So you are talking about discriminating between a classic two mode, a classical state here and a classical state here. Same just same as in the classical problem. Uh, the when when I send a laser probe. But for for the entangled state transmitter, we uh, my colleague Barris Erkman, he was also a, then a student of Jeff Shapiro. We analyzed a particular receiver that uh, uses a nonlinear medium, uh, an optical parametric amplifier, to <coughs> mix the target return mode and a retained reference within a receiver. And obviously, if there is no target present, you get no correlations again back. But if I do have uh, this classical correlation left over, that OPA amplifies that correlation a little bit. And you're able to detect that classical correlation, the phase sensitive correlation, as a uh, intensity signature in your direct detector. I'm not showing the mathematics behind this. You can go take a look at this paper. But the final result we get is looks something like this. So remember, this is I talked about the quantum Chernoff exponent, where I have a hypothesis test of rho zero, m copies of rho zero versus rho one. Your minimum error probability is upper bounded by one half times e to the minus m times this Chernoff exponent, where this bound gets tight when m is high. Okay, so it's actually it's a, it's a asymptotically tight bound. When, so what we find is that if I use a coherent state probe, my Chernoff exponent is given by uh, this quantity, kappa ns over 4 nb. So this is, you can think of this as a signal to noise ratio. Kappa is the transmissivity, ns is the mean transmit signal photon number. So this is the return photon number per mode. This is the noise photon number per mode. And if I use this SPDC transmitter, but with an optimal receiver, we don't know what that receiver is. That optimal receiver, you get a factor of four improvement in the signal to noise ratio, meaning it's a factor of four in the error in the exponent here. So xi becomes a factor of four higher. Okay. And this receiver that Barris and I developed in the last that PRA that I showed, that got us a factor of two improvement over the classical. But we could not get to this factor of four. And after that, there were several attempts and several interesting uh, special cases that I'm not going to talk about. But this problem from the 2009 paper, it remained open for about nine years until uh, last year. Um, Jeff Shapiro's group, they found a receiver that gets all the way to the factor of four improvement. And I'll show you that in a second. But even this receiver, the one that I just showed, this OPA receiver, requires quantum mechanics to correctly explain. So even though the light that you were trying to discriminate towards classical, it has a pre-function representation. Uh, it gives you a, a performance improvement over the best possible classical transmitter you could have started with. So, so that starting with that entangled state gives you, leaves you with a classically correlated state that is more powerful than what you could have had if you started originally with a classically correlated state. OK, so now this 6 dB of improvement in signal to noise ratio only happens, interestingly, in this bad regime, a lot of loss very low brightness signal, and a lot of thermal noise. So these two are fine at optical frequencies, but a lot of thermal noise is not. I mean, NB equals 20 photons per mode. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you, can, you will never have that. Even at 1550 nanometers in a, the daytime operation, we are probably looking at 10 to the minus 5 photons per mode or so, something like that. Okay, so uh, this is obviously not in the regime where this is, this is going to have any practical application. So, but this was implemented by Zashen uh, Zhang, who is now at University of Arizona as well. He was a postdoc at Jeff Shapiro's group. Um, in an experiment, they used a lithium niobate crystal to build their SPDC source, and the, they used the same pump, as you can see, to, to, to generate the entangled photons and to drive that OPA receiver. But this EDF over here, this was generating that broadband thermal noise source. This is an AC amplified spontaneous emission source that was emulating that high thermal noise. So this was obviously, this was artificial, but it was done to prove the theory. Um, and, it, and it worked fine. And it shows that, you know, they, in, they showed this as signal to noise ratio gain uh, over the classical limit using their, using their quantum sensor. But this led us to think two, two directions. So one, one thing we thought, okay, well, how ingrained is this improvement to that particular on versus off problem? So we looked at a problem of one versus two point targets. This is an active imaging problem. Um, uh, and we saw the same sort of improvement we saw for the, for the zero versus one, the target detection problem. So it is actually more pervasive than just that one problem. Um, but more importantly, to justify operating in that high noise scenario, the obvious thing to think of is to operate in a microwave regime. Because there, NB equals to 
20 or m equals to 100 will actually be something that you will be, I mean, so that, that noise will be there because of the, your, your wavelength and operating temperature. Um, but microwave fields are, um, uh, the, you, you, you're working with a much uh, the smaller bandwidth. Your, your, your time bandwidth product was that m that I had on the x-axis of those probability of error plots, right? So to get the, to, to a particular value of m to get the classical quantum benefit to show up, you, you're looking at integrating for maybe a minute or longer. Okay, so this is, so you really have to be in a scenario where a long dwell time radar application is, in, is interesting. So there's some, might be some in, niche applications for microwave radar, but it's still, it's not, it's, it's not extremely clear where exactly would this be, um, be applicable. But there's a paper we did on analyzing this, this concept for a, a particular optomechanical uh, microwave entangled transmitter where you generate microwave photon that is entangled with an optical mode that is held locally at the transmitter. And then the microwave field is what interrogates the object and comes back. And you build this OPA receiver using uh, this optomechanical system. Okay. Um, then the question is how do you design that optimal quantum receiver that gets you the full factor of four? And um, so first of all, designing quantum optimal receivers is by itself, it's a very, very uh, hard task. And there are uh, there are only few examples that we know of where you can exactly attain the quantum limit of uh, discriminating, telling apart between quantum states. So writing down the minimum probability of error of choosing between a set of states is actually conceptually quite simple. It, it, we can use a, a formalism developed by UN, Kennedy, and Lack to write down the minimum probability of error. But um, there was, uh, I, I think the only uh, clean example of getting exactly to the quantum limit of discriminating two, two, two states is uh, but that it was developed by Sam Dolinar in his PhD thesis many years ago, telling apart between two classical states of light, two coherent state pulses. And the receiver uses a feed forward process where instead of putting your pulse directly into your detector, you pulse, put the pulse uh, added with a feedback signal into the detector. So your detector's Poisson point process is driven by the sum intensity. And then every time you get a photon click, you switch between applying one or two, one signal versus the other in this, in this, in this port. And, uh, you know, miraculously for this particular problem, Dolinar found that you get exactly to the quantum minimum error probability limit of telling apart between two coherent states. And this concept doesn't even generalize to three coherent states. I mean, in fact, we might we believe that it, this exact idea does not work for three coherent states. You actually need something more quantum within the receiver. You need things like squeezing. But this is what inspired uh, Shuntao Zhuang, who was a student of Jeff, who's also studying in the University of Arizona this January. Um, he, is, uh, so, so he was inspired by the Dolina receiver, but for this quantum illumination problem that I talked about, he said, what if I was allowed to, because you're trying to sense phase sensitive correlations between two, two more Gaussian states. He said, instead of allowing you to, to, to switch around to, to, or feedback the displacement, which you do to, uh, tell apart between minus alpha and plus alpha, which was Dolinar's intuition, is that you take the whole constellation and move it around the x-axis on your phase space um, uh, to, uh, and then use photon detection signature to tell which one is more likely. He said, I'll use a Dolinar style feedback, but on squeezing instead of displacement. Okay, so in fact, his, his schedule of, of uh, applying this squeezing to, to, your, to, your income, to your two mode light mimics exactly Dolinar's schedule for, for switching displacements. And they were able to find the, get this entire factor of four improvement uh, that we had proposed in that paper 10 years ago uh, using this receiver. So this was not experimentally implemented, but this is just a theory paper from last year. Uh, so going back, so we, we just have seen two problems, right? In the passive imaging problem and then this active imaging problem. We saw two problems where you had a single parameter encoded in an N mode state both cases, the state had a proper p-function representation. It was a classically correlated thermal state. Um, and in one case, we found that the optimal receiver uh, was describable classically. In the other case, the optimal receiver was not describable classically. So is there a natural boundary of the p-functions of, of these classically correlated states for where you really need quantum resources to get to the fundamental performance limit? And this is, this in the most general form, is a very hard question, but you're looking at some special cases of it. Okay, so I'm, I think I'm at the very end of my presentation. So I'm going to just uh, show you very quickly a couple of slides from my next section. And uh, then I'll leave uh, 
the rest uh, and the more detailed discussions to uh, after my talk. Um, when you are in the low loss, low noise regime, so you're looking at things like a, 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 a very local imaging problem, like a metrology problem, you're trying to gauge a sense a little bit of phase modulation in a, in a biological sample, for example. Uh, we all probably have seen this in some form or the other. There is a sh standard short noise limit versus a Heisenberg limit in the sensitivity of sensing a phase. So you have an unknown phase, you have n photon budget, and you can prepare a quantum state where you can retain some entanglement, and then you do a measurement to gauge the, uh, the, the unknown phase. If I use a classical state, your variance of that estimate scales as 1 over n. Quantum mechanically, if you use um, uh, things like noon states or squeeze states, or there are other example states where you can get a sensitivity of uh, 1 over n squared. Um, so this has been known in the community for a long time. And what happens is that if you have losses in your interferometer, you never get that 1 over n scaling, but you actually, you never get that 1 over n square scaling. You start out looking like 1 over n square, but you get a 1 over n scaling as n becomes high. But where that constant factor gap between the classical performance is driven by how much loss you, in, you have in your system. Uh, a few years ago, Ian Wamsley's group, they looked at generalizing this problem to an entanglement assisted sensing. Okay, so they said, what if you had D phases, and they're, they're all unknown, but you have still a photon budget of capital N mean photon number, but you get to split them between these different D modes. Um, what is the optimal state that you should use that minimizes this uh, sum variance of these thetas, the unknown phases? If I take those N photons and chunk it up into small classical states, coherent states, for example, or any classically correlated state, I get a performance that goes as d squared over n. So see that 1 over n over here is still there, but you get a d squared. I could take those, those n photons and slice it, slice it up into n over d chunks for each mode and use an individual quantum <coughs> sensor for these individual modes. I could maybe use a noon state for each one of these modes. Then I retrieve that 1 over n squared scaling, but you get a d squared becomes d cubed, which is worse. So I, you know, this is bad because you're increasing the variance. And in that paper, what they showed was this uh, a specific transmitter state that it looks like a noon state, but as you can see, it's very, very hard to, to actually make that state. But they, would, they showed that with this state, they can retrieve the d square and uh, still have that n square. So after this paper, there was a succession of papers in the last few years on um, entanglement assisted sensing in situations like this, where you have a bunch of sensors that are getting a different view of the same parameter. Okay, so think of, you know, you have, uh, we talked about the LIGO example, right? So if you have multiple LIGO stations, different points, you're sensing the same gravitational field, but they have somehow, they have access to entanglement that you could use to collectively probe. So this, so what this kind of result showed is that you can go beyond what you can get with using squeezing independently at those sensors. But this was one standalone example, but this was, this inspired a, a, work, a paper that we just put out on the archive recently. Uh, this was sort of a very, very specific problem, okay? of uh, sensing a small deflection of an optical beam. So you're in the near field regime, meaning you're in a diffraction limited near field means your, your um, transmitter area, aperture area pr product divided by lambda L squared is bigger than one. So you can have multiple spatial modes that are almost lossless propagate o over that regime, over that d distance. And you're trying to estimate a small deflection. So what is, if I give you a optical bandwidth, integration time, total power, and no, and whatever choice you might want to make on the receiver, what's the best way to use that photon budget in order to make a transmitter that gives you the best sensitivity? Now, this problem shows up in a variety of actual sensing problems. Uh, probably one of the most important ones is atomic force microscopy, where you, uh, you sense a small deflection of a cantilever by bouncing off a, a laser pulse, and that, that longitudinal displacement translates to a lateral displacement. Uh, this appears in, in pointing acquisition and tracking for laser beams for optical comms. And uh, here, the intuition was that these different spatial modes, the orthogonal spatial modes that you can accommodate, and the temporal modes, they all have a different view of that deflection, of that beam displacement. Okay, and when you write it down mathematically, it shows up as a giant Mark-Zinder-like interferometer array, where each one of these modes are seeing a different phase modulation. And we see a very similar style of result that we found that if I use a classical probe, you, so this MT is the number of temporal modes over the integration time, time bandwidth product. MS is the number of spatial modes, which is roughly equal to the Fresnel number product. Um, and if I use a classical probe, I get a performance that goes as 1 over square root of the total power times total integration time. 
if I use a spatially entangled probe over these, these spatial modes, but temporal modes are still unentangled, this is sort of a product state transmission, you get a 1 over p times square root of t, and if I use a fully entangled transmission, and this one uh, gives you 1 over pt. So very similar to what we saw before, but the difference was that in this case, your transmitter was a uh, correlated, uh, was a, it's a, it's a multi-mode entangled Gaussian state transmitter. So this is not like that generalized noon state. So this is something you, you can actually build, write down a prescription for building in, a, in an experiment. And people have demonstrated highly multi-mode Gaussian states of entangled, uh, entanglement in, uh, in, a, in a lab. So uh, that brings me to the last uh, thing I wanted to say. Um, so we talked about sort of the two regimes of high loss, high noise, and low loss, low noise. But the most interesting scenario for optical imaging is perhaps high loss and no, low noise. I mean, that's the most practical scenario you would be in. And as I said at the very beginning of my talk, is that in that regime, you don't want to send a quantum state. It's a bad idea to send a quantum state in a high loss environment. It was only in when high loss and high noise situation where you can win by sending a quantum state over the best possible classical state that I talked about in the quantum illumination part of the talk. But there was a one uh, uh, problem that we considered, this was several years ago on a DARPA program called Quantum Sensor Program back in 2007, 2009. We were looking at, this was in collaboration with Prem Kumar, Jeff Shapiro, and a few people at Harris Corporation. Uh, there were two effects that, uh, if you're in quantum optics, I'm sure you have seen this in some form or the other. If I have loss, and I have a coherence state I'm putting in, the signal to noise ratio going in is four times beta squared. Because if I do homodyne detection on this coherent state, I get a mean of beta and a variance of one fourth. If I do homodyne, ideal homodyne detection, get a Gaussian distribution. If you pass it through a loss, your signal to noise ratio goes down by a factor proportional to your transmissivity. But if I inject squeeze vacuum, in the limit of high squeezing, you retrieve back your original input signal to noise ratio. So you're squeezing the vacuum you're of the quadrature you are detecting using your homodyne. That's the intuition, but this is very simple to work out. Another effect that I'm, sh again, sure you might have seen in some form or the other, if I am do doing a homodyne detection with a subunity detection efficiency, eta is the detection efficiency of the homodyne, if I use an inline squeezer, squeezing before the detector, this is a phase sensitive amplifier, you can wash away the effect of that detection efficiency to a certain extent when, and the limit when this gain or the squeezing of this uh, PSA is high, you, you, it almost, it's like the light is seeing your, your homodyne detector combined with that pre-detection PSA appears to the impinging light as a higher efficiency homodyne detection. Okay, so we use this, uh, these two concepts of using offline squeezing and using inline squeezing in an experiment which was uh, but actually implemented at Harris Corporation, uh, back, back, back in the, the, and this was for homodyne detection LADAR. Okay, so for that application, I cannot go into the detail right now, but we had a soft aperture situation. You have your pupil is not a hard circular aperture, it has an attenuation. And that attenuation of the aperture was my kappa. Okay. And what we did was we injected squeeze vacuum from the back to, into the aperture. And the aperture appeared to be a hard aperture to the light, to the detector signal to noise ratio. And your, we had a phase sensitive amplifier before the detector array to make the detection efficiency higher. And using this, so this is just the, as we increase the squeeze, squeezing of the squeeze vacuum injection, as I increase the squeezing in the PSA, your signal and your noise power spectrum, this is how sort of they compared. The blue is the signal, red is the noise, so this is the, the, the best, and this, we did an, uh, simulation with the US Air Force test target, you can see the performance improvement in the signal to noise ratio shows up as a performance, as a resolution improvement. And we did a simple experiment uh, showing that using two point sources. So anyhow, so we have talked about a variety of different applications. I want to uh, end here with a sort of high level summary of what we talked about today. Uh, at the very beginning of my talk, I said that the theme of all of these applications in sensing and imaging and also communication receivers, something that I did not talk about today, is that often some sort of a pre-detection all optical transformation can position that information bearing photon or your light in the better, in a more information favorable way to the detection noise. And if you know what that problem is and how the detector noise uh, behaves for quantum mechanics, you can choose you can, uh, what that best possible detection, pre-detection transformation is. We talked about a couple of passive imaging problems where we showed examples of getting super resolution um, sensitivity in uh, telling apart between point like constellations by doing spatial mode transformations before you detect. Uh, 
This actually could have applications not just in spatial imaging problems, but also in problems in temporal imaging, uh, spectroscopy problems, time resolution problems. You do that, you can do that mode sorting not just in space, but in time or spec or frequency also, right? Uh, and uh, Christine Silberhorn's group actually did a paper after the one that I showed we did, where her group have now translated that into a two-point source problem, but um, in, um, in the spectral domain. So, they are looking at resolving two, two spectral lines that are very close to each other by doing some sort of a pre-detection so mode sorting. And then we talked about a few active sensing problems. We talked about how entanglement shared between multiple sensors can give an added performance boost over the traditionally known quantum sense, uh, sensors. This is a problem that has been not explored that much. We don't know what kind of entangled states are good for particular problems. This is a whole wide area open, open for research. Um, and then um, I, we saw that quantum sensing typically is most promising when, uh, in a low loss uh, setting. But if you're in a low loss and uh, in, a, in a high loss setting, but if you have also high noise, then quantum radars may have promise. Although it seemed like the high noise to justify that you want to be at a microwave wavelength, but at a microwave wavelength, to get the quantum classical separation to work out to a reasonable amount, you need a very long dwell time. You need a long integration time. So you have to be in the right application scenario for it to make sense. Um, uh, and then finally, we saw some examples of a completely classical imaging scenario using laser pulses, but using quantum stuff within the confines of your receiver can give you better performance. This is what we also see in classical communication applications too. Okay, with that, uh, I'll stop and take any questions if there is time. Thank you.